Great, so I think we'll get started. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you're joining us from. A warm welcome on behalf of the Boost team to our Bright Spots webinar uh, featuring the story, My Village, My Home, a tool to strengthen community involvement in immunization, which was submitted on behalf of the JSI team in Zimbabwe. Uh, before we get started, I just wanna go over a few housekeeping slides with everyone. Um, we are using a Zoom meeting format today, so we ask that you remain muted to minimize any background noise. Um, you can always raise your hand during the presentation to speak or ask a question. Um, you can also use the chat box as well to submit questions, make a comment, or respond to other participants. Uh, now would be a great time to introduce yourselves, uh, so if you want to enter in the chat box, uh, tell us who you are, uh, your name, and where you're joining us from. Uh, for those who are joining us for the first time, the BUSE community is a diverse network of more than 1,700 immunization professionals from over 130 countries. Through our online platform, boostcommunity.org, we offer opportunities for our community to connect with peers, strengthen leadership and advocacy skills, uh, and grow in their careers. Um, just a note that we will be storing the session recording and slides in a resource library of the Bright Spots Boost sorry, the Boost Bright Spots Learning Group. Um, so we do encourage you to join that learning group on the Boost platform. Um, a little bit more about the Bright Spots series. Uh, Bright Spots are stories that shine a light on the work that's happening on the ground and inspire immunization professionals everywhere to learn, adapt, and take action in their own communities. Uh, from engaging with religious leaders in the community to improving supply chain delivery to reach the last mile. There's innovation occurring at all levels of the system. The second round of Bright Spots, which was announced a few months ago, includes 10 stories from six countries. All of those stories are now live um, and can be accessed on the Bright Spots microsite, which is brightspots.boostcommunity.org. Uh, through this live engagement series, Boost offers an opportunity for our members to hear directly from Bright Spots story submitters to better understand their challenge or program and how they achieve success. With that, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce um, our speaker for the, se the session, who's Koskar from the JSI Zimbabwe team. Um, and I'm actually gonna hand it over to her to introduce herself and her team from Zimbabwe. So over to you, Koskar. Thank you very much. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Koskar Ramashape. I'm a nurse uh, by profession. But uh, I've done a lot of community health, community nursing health, and uh, I've been working for Ministry of Health Zimbabwe. Then I joined the uh, JSI. I've been JSI since JSI USA for since 2011, and uh, I've uh, actually worked very closely with uh, the team looking uh, for this particular project, the my village, my home. I worked with Adelaide Shelley uh, until. I think she joined me for the pilot project we were together and also for the, uh, the, the, the when we, we scaled up to the other 16 districts that we worked in. So otherwise, I'm just currently I'm an immunization technical officer working under the JSI project on urban immunization. Thank you very much. Great, thanks, Kaskar. And I think before we get started, we did have just a quick poll, um, which should be launched in just a second. Um, and we wanted to know how familiar you are with the My Village, uh, My Home tool. Um, so if you could go ahead and um, answer the poll question in front of you, that would be great. Great, thanks Liz. We're gonna give everyone a few more seconds to respond and then I will share results. Great, I think that is just about everyone. So I'm gonna go ahead and close the poll. Um, it looks like most people on the call today are very familiar with this tool, about 50%, um, and then a few have heard of it, and we have several who also have never heard of it before, so um, excited to dive in.
Great, thanks, MJ. Um, and now we have just a short video clip to share with you all um, before we launch into the presentation. I'm gonna go ahead and play that on my screen. My child, I'm going to tell you a story about how our village here in Zimbabwe became stronger. Once, not every child was fully vaccinated. Engaging the community changed that. Every family receives a card to document the vaccinations their child receives. The village health worker ensures the data is accurate. As the village head, I use this information to track every child in the village and their immunization status on a tool called My Village, My Home. Each brick represents a vaccination a child received. When a brick is missing, it weakens the house. Too many missing bricks and the house will collapse. It's a simple and inexpensive way for our community to see the state of our children's vaccination status and when we need to take action. We identify the children with missing bricks and make sure their families bring them for vaccination to keep the community safe. When we work together to create accountability around vaccinations, the village becomes stronger brick by brick. The country becomes resilient village by village. Over 2,000 villages in Zimbabwe are now using the tool. And this type of community engagement enables the world to be healthier, country by country. Great. Um, so now over to you, Kaskar. I love it. Thank you very much. Uh, so I was the there's a background, JSI supported two districts in Manikaland province. It was Makon and Chipinga in 2017. That's where we started uh, the My Village, My Home. And we piloted it in 10 health facilities. And uh, the funding was from uh, JSI, from uh, Bill and Melinda Gates. They funded this project. Then in 2008, from the results that we got from this pilot, the Ministry of Health recommended that we scale up to 16 more districts in the country. These 16 districts had been identified to have a very low pentavalent 3 or DTP3, as most people call it, vaccination coverage. And they also had uh, quite uh, large populations. So this intervention, the, my village, my home, is actually, it, it engages the village head who is uh, in Zimbabwe is the, like the community leader at village level. And then it also engages the village health worker who is the, the, the lowest rank health worker in the, in the system of the health system in Zimbabwe to take ownership or commit ownership of the immunization status of their children. So this map is actually showing the districts that we scaled up to 16 of them. And then they we then uh, the top, the pilot districts that we supported they are they actually selected on the basis that they had very large populations their immunization coverage was low despite a lot of support from a uh, uh, M chip the M chip which was a previous project that had supported them to with the red direct trainings but they still had a very low immunization coverage and the high dropout rates. So this project was trying to, to promote community ownership on the immunization program, probably in a way to see whether it would improve the coverage, also to increase demand for vaccination and improve default tracking system using the village head, because the village head is the one who is staying with the community. He knows all the people in that village. So we're going to utilize that wisdom that he had to check all the children. And then we're also hoping to increase vaccination coverage PENDA-3 as a proxy indicator and also reduce dropout rates with the focus on uh, PENTA-1 to, to uh, Mrs. Rubena-1. How it works, we, the whole process, we start with a, a, a village, then a, identifying village health workers, that's how we started. You identify a village health worker in a given community, and then the village head. And then we trained, we gave, we in, gave them an orientation on the project. We were training them what the whole project is about, what tools they will be using. That is the for the village head. 
the 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 tool the the village health worker the village health tool and then for the village health worker the Z register. So the village health worker the initial exercise that she did was to register all children who were below two years in her village, register them in a in a separate register, and then she would also register their immunization status then, and then she would. She was using the child health card uh, for the particular children that should have registered in the area to update, to, to enter those children, she entered those some children onto the village head too. And then uh, every month, then she would be checking to see though that those children have really reported, have received their immunization, which is due. So from a village, from a, the child health card, she would then record onto her ZEP register. And then from the ZEP register, she enters that information onto the village head too. And then the, this tool would be kept by the village head and it would be displayed at his homestead. So even during meetings, the village head could actually use it to, to discuss the, the immunization status of his community with the mothers or caregivers who will be there at the meeting. So at least they all are aware of what the situation is like in their village. So the village head and village health workers would review the chart every month to see if there are any rows of missing weeks, that is if there are any children who haven't been vaccinated. If there are any, then the village, uh, village health worker would check that information up to the, to the nurse at the clinic and also advise those mothers, they, those caregivers to report to the clinic so that they get their immunizations, their children's immunization status are updated and get the children vaccinated. So it's a cycle from the village, village health worker who identifies the, the children to the village head who monitors or who keeps a record of those children as well. And then if there are any who are not vaccinated, then they are referred to the rural health center so that at least they get vaccinated. Their immunization status is updated. Next. So in Zimbabwe, we used the four tools. We used the child health card, which is at the bottom there, which is the source document for all the information that we were working with. And then the child health card was used to enter information, which is on the ZEP register for the village health worker and on the, also on the My Village, My Home tool for the village aid. And that same child health card information is also entered into the clinic ZEP register. So it's like the, the four are linked uh, in a way. So during home visits, the village, the child health cards are presented by the caregivers and then information from that card is recorded onto the village health worker register. And then the village health worker takes that same information to enter onto the my village, my home tool for the village head. And they, together with the rural health center nurse, when they meet every, they were meeting every month, the village health, village health worker and the rural health center nurse, they would actually compare notes with what is in the ZIP register at the clinic and what is in the ZIP register for the village health worker, whether the children, all the children are actually appearing in, in all the three tools that we were using. Next. So during the implementation of the project, we, we, we didn't work alone as a, as a M -chip, uh, as M -chip. We, we had our communities who actually contributed to this whole pilot that was without them, we were not going to, 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 to implement anything. So we want to thank them very much. And then the village heads and the village health workers, they actually were the main, uh, uh, people who actually worked on this project at village level, because they are the ones who did all the work now to collect all the data and to be monitoring and following up the children. And then we have the rural health center, which actually supported the, the two, the village head and the village health worker to make sure that data from the village is also linked to the clinic. And the clinic is the one which were the staff were then supposed to make sure all the children are vaccinated using the records from the village head and the village of work. 
And then we also want to thank the JSI team members who worked on that project. A special mention to Adelaide Shelley. Uh, she really, I really want to say thank you very much, Adelaide. She said that we don't have her now, but I really appreciate the support that she gave uh, on this project. The Minister of Health, EPI Unit Head Office, they really supported us with the project. The provincial office in Manipaland, they gave us the authority to implement the project in their two districts. So we would really want to appreciate what they did for us and how they assisted us. And then the district offices, the district health offices in Chipinge and Makoni for allowing us to work in their districts and work with their facilities and in in, in their facilities in those districts that we worked in, the 10 health facilities. So those, these are the, the, all the people that actually contributed towards the implementation of this project. Next. So we did uh, an evaluation. The evaluation was actually conducted, was after the scaling up, we then did an evaluation and uh, in 10 randomly selected facilities, five per district, we selected two districts. And uh, during the, the evaluation, we actually had exit interviews with caregivers. We had brought their children for vaccination to actually see whether the project, the project had actually linked down to them, to, to, to the grassroots as we anticipated it to have done. So that the, the caregivers actually knew about the project and they actually knew that they now had to go and get their children vaccinated. Lest they get the village head would expose them during a meeting, one of the meetings, and they would really get embarrassed. So we really were asking them also a question to say whether they were aware of the project and whether they valued the project. Then we had in-depth interviews with staff from the selected facilities. We also interviewed the village health workers who were implementing and the village heads who were actually implementing. If you check in the picture there, there's a village health worker with the registers that she was using for the ASAP registers which she was using. Um, I think, Kaskar, you might be on mute. Sorry. Yeah, we also asked it to their key responsibilities during this, the, the, this using this approach. And uh, most of them, they actually said uh, at least 82% of them noted the improvements in reaching more caregivers. And they're also doing Almost all of them did to photo tracking, and uh, only five, five or thirty percent had any missing bricks. So it means they are actually following up all their children, and very few had missing bricks on their um, on their village yet too. And we're updating those registers, and their knowledge on the child health card was quite good. Next, because we had trained them on the use of the child health card. And then we knowledge on the importance and the vaccines and the due dates on the child health card was this was critical for them to know when they are now following up to see whether the, the due dates are being followed and whether the schedule is being followed. So you find that the uh, majority of them were quite aware of the not on the child health card and due dates they knew. And then the child health card retention was quite high almost 80% and uh, knowledge on the tool was also quite high. Those who reported missing bricks on the, those few that reported that they had missing bricks, about half of them, we, the, the reasons given were mainly travel to other places because the, the, one of the districts in Chiping is shares a border with South Africa. So most of the people go to South Africa for the, the husbands go there for work and the wives follow. So most of them travel to other places was the main reason for missing bricks. Ignorance was about 58%. Religious beliefs, which we all, always think is the reason for missing bricks, but it's not from, from this pilot, that evolution that we did. It was only 
and the others may be just other reasons like illness for the caregiver and such reasons were given. So there was improvement in Jufota tracking done by villagers, villagers and caregivers. 67% of the village heads reported that one of they knew that one of their roles is keeping the, the tool up to date with no missing bricks. And 94% of the village heads also understood their role to work in collaboration with the village of Waker. And oh, a lot of the caregivers also knew about the two, if the, if the two heads, their child registered on it. So on the picture there, it was at one of the clinics which was doing very well in Gope, one of, our, one of the districts that we evaluated, where they actually had for the five village health workers that were following up, each one would come if she has any decoder that she has picked, she comes and put, puts them in that small box there where it's written EPI decoder. She puts it there, the nurse also checks every day to see if there's any decoder that has been put in, then they check, they follow them up. In the nurse village health worker, when she comes next, she checks whether that child has come to get vaccinated. So it was a, quite a good system of tracking the defaulters. Next. Then 82% 80, of the village health workers also reported that they are able to reach more children using this system because they were saying, ah, we are now actually, we have actually now picked a lot of more children. Didn't know that we have so many children in our village but the registration exercise exposed a lot of other children whom they were not even aware of. So it was, it's, it was really a good for them. And they were conducting now default checking at least to make sure their register is up to date. And also to make sure if theirs is up to date, then the village head is to also be up to date. So one village head actually said he didn't want his village to be destroyed by a cyclone of preventable diseases. And he promised that, that he would make sure all bricks for each child are in place. We thought it was really good if it's coming from somebody like a village head. So it's like they really appreciated the whole, appreciated the whole approach. Uh, this data, we remember we were measuring DTP1 and MR1 dropout rates, comparing the two years that we implemented the project. The statistics, maybe they might not be very interesting, very as much as we had anticipated, but we I think the biggest issue that we had was also population denominators in the in all the clinics, the 16 clin the 16 districts that we worked on. You find that the dropout rates only dropped in about five of the districts, somewhere had negative dropout rates. So I, and also I think the main other reason was we didn't implement this project for a long time. It was only for about 18 months. So it was too short a period to actually measure the impact of the whole project on, on the dropout rates as indicated. So this was just like a preliminary assessment to see whether the, we, there was an impact or, or from the project that we had implemented, especially focusing on the dropout rates. So we find that about five of the districts had reduced the drop portraits. And those were the ones which were doing very well when we followed them up. Next. The challenge is that we faced uh, the number of, when we were implementing the project, we actually conducted quite a number of supportive visits with scheduled, scheduled, scheduled supportive visits. But when we left, the minister now had many other commitments to actually maybe try to uh, to continue with the full the, the regular supportive visits, and uh, as we also said, the funding was limited, so we only did it in a very small geographical area, the 16 districts. So that's one challenge. Those are the two challenges that we noted that maybe when we left, it's like supervision was there, but maybe not as much as we have wanted. Uh, the, maybe the villagers really need to be continuously supported and you know visited so that at least they, their motivation remains uh, up uh, to implement the project. But uh, I think maybe we with the integrated integrated supportive supervision currently being implemented now, I think that maybe by now it has improved. So some of the solutions regular follow up motivated the community workers is. 
they saw their efforts being appreciated. And uh, they, they, were, they actually advised the district supervisors to integrate supervision for, with other programs, which I think currently that's what the ministry is now doing, uh, conducting integrated supervision. So NVMH is also part of uh, that support. Next. Next slide. Yeah. So the lessons that, that we learned, the community leaders of village heads and the village of workers team work strengthened the infant tracking system, whereby they knew each and every child, and I mean each and every child in their village by name, not only knowing that there's a child 18 months old, but by name, and they could actually now track their defaulters just by visualization of the tool. Because if you hang the tool on the wall, they, you can actually tell quickly that child, there's no brick there. They've actually missed their due date. So that it was a good lesson learned for the, through this project. Because this tool was being kept at the village head residence. And then the importance of community ownership in the success of an immunization program, I think, when we once we started involving them, there was so much excitement and everybody, when we got there to support them, you know, they would really be, you know, happy to show us their tools, show us their registers, and would also follow up some of the, the, the children whom they were following up, and you would really see that, yes, there is a link, and the, these two, they the grassroots, they are working together as a team, and also the link at the clinic was also very good, because now the clinic would actually tell our men, uh, default as they have in their particular area, utilizing the information from the zip register for the village health work. So I, th I think those were the lessons, the big lessons that we learned with this approach. This picture is actually, sorry, this picture is actually depicting a village, okay, okay. Recommendations, implementation of this low cost intervention needs to take place on a large scale to have an impact that is measurable, yes. I think it, if you do it on a larger scale and over a longer period, it will have, uh, you can actually measure the impact. Need to continuously follow up the village heads and uh, also the, the MVMH can facilitate a sense of shared responsibility and collective accountability when the community leaders have been empowered. Then there's need, you actually don't est underestimate the strength of these community-based workers in matters related to childhood. I was actually surprised myself how committed they are. And then if they, their roles have to be clearly spelled and uh, ensure that the childhood card, the childhood card remains the source document for the data used during implementation. So information of every child being checked should match in all the tools that you are using. Like in us, we're using the village health register, the rural health center register, then the MVMH tool. All the information on those four tools was matching when we checked. That was one area that also we're checking during our supervisory visits. Using all tools, all the tools, data triangulation to ensure data quality can be carried out during follow-up visits, which is one area, as I said, that we're actually following up and conducting the, and making sure that that data triangulates well from all the four tools. Next. Great, well, I think we're at um, our, question and answer portion of the presentation. So thanks so much for that very informative presentation, Kaskar. Um, I think we mentioned in the chat box, but we are taking questions. So feel free to enter your question or comment in there. And then if you're, if you'd like to voice over your question, just be sure to raise your hand and we will call on you. Um, so it looks like we had a comment from Lokesh. So uh, wanted to say that it was a really excellent tool for easy follow-up of children and improving coverage at the village level. Um, more than community participation, this is a good example of community ownership of, it, of an immunization program, which I know you mentioned, Kaskar. 
um, and then noting on some challenges. Um, annual trainings for community leaders and health workers might be required when people change and new people need to be aware of the tool. Um, and then continued supply of logistics, providing charge, charts and um, logistics supplies. Um, and it looks like Lakesh also shared another tool as well, a documented study from India in the chat box. So thanks for sharing that. Um, and yes, Lara, you mentioned that you'd be happy to speak to the connection with the India work. Um, we'd be happy to hear more about that. Sure, thanks. Yeah, and I know it was in, uh, and thanks everybody for joining and um, recognition, of course, to Adelaide, Adelaide and, and her family, because a lot of this was also the benefit of her thoughts and dedication and work. Um, as was noted in one of the previous slides where it showed the My Village, My Home rollout, in fact, the methodology and learning that was applied in Zimbabwe grew from that work in India, which started around 2011, 12, I believe, and where we were looking in some very challenged areas of Uttar Pradesh and Jharkhand states where community engagement was identified as a need for increasing coverage. These were what are considered to be in Jharkhand, for example, some of the tribal areas where community engagement is, is vital. And also in Uttar Pradesh, urban, as well as some more rural locations where we knew that the coverage gaps were not as much about service delivery as they were about that interface with the communities and the understanding and, and collaboration between ANMs, Anganwadi workers and ASHAs for the community mobilization. So we really explored the use of the My Village, My Home tool in those environments in India, also with the assurance of the maternal child tracking system, as well as with the cards themselves, as was noted at the beginning of Koskar's presentation for Zimbabwe. My Village, My Home is not meant to be a standalone tool. It actually is part of the resource package that would be of use with a community mobilizer linked with a health facility, linked with the clients themselves. The visual aspect of the tool being very important, the interactive component, and then being able to link that with the data systems that are available locally at the facility. So of course the immunization registers, any do lists that would be necessary, and then some local census information around the population, the pregnant women and the households where you would have young children who are eligible for vaccination. So really that India learning then was adapted and expanded in several other countries, Timor-Leste, it's been done in Malawi, here in Zimbabwe as just presented. And what we've seen across all of these different environments is the importance of this interaction, the community visual engagement and rapport, and then having that connection between community mobilizers, community volunteers, and the health system themselves, so that if there are questions around vaccination, the health worker is available to answer those questions. And there's that sense of, as the My Village, My Home house shows, that sense of community under one roof. And that's really what we learned from the information in India and the learning that came out of India, as well as the adaptability of these concepts within other contexts, be it Africa, Asia, or um, the Pacific Islands. So that's really behind all of this, an important aspect of this. And perhaps one question that I would like to also pose to the team is, how has this been working now with assurance of some of these other tools, such as the child health cards um, and the evolution that's happening with the tracking and information systems that are being used uh, for the individual child tracking and then of course for showing uh, coverage improvement and equity in the system, thanks. Great, thanks so much, Laura. And I think we had a little bit of activity in the chat, but just wanted to note that the presentation um, including the recording and slides will be available on the Bright Spots um, learning group, as well as the full story. Um, I didn't know, Kaskar, did you want to respond to, to Laura's comment? Uh, 
Yeah, I I didn't quite get the question at the end. Maybe if Chiki Flora could just come back again to repeat again. Sure, Kaskar. It was I was asking yes. about now the availability of the child health cards through the system and how that's continuing now to be linked with the My Village, My Home and the community approaches to make sure that those composite tools are available and, and being used. Yeah, they might feel the child wrote cards stocks are really improved. I think when we started the pilot in Manikal and it was a big problem. There were no child road cards. So even the issues of the due dates and shape and recording was a bit of an issue. But I think currently the child road cards are now there. And we, we have also integrated this into the uh, red rec trainings. So it will be part of it will be part when whenever there's a red rec training going on. MVMH is part of that. Great, and we have another question from Jenny who asks, uh, what has been the MVMH experience um, in various countries in urban or semi-urban locations? In, in Koska, in Zimbabwe, we don't have an experience in, in an urban setting, but we are currently conducting an urban immunization situation analysis. We have a project that we are on now, and we are hoping to try and see whether this approach can also apply even in an urban setting. This will be, yes, so, so this is something that we will try and see later, but not on this project, but we hope to, 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 to see whether it's possible to implement the same approach in an urban setting. Thank you. Great, thanks Kaskar. And I think we have either a comment or a question from Kate, if you wanted to go ahead and, and share. Yeah, thanks Liz. Um, hi Kaskar, thanks so much for the presentation. It was really great to see this and to learn more about the approach. Of course, you know I know about it, but I had two questions for you. Um, one is about whether or not you think the tool or certain aspects of the My Village, My Home approach could be applied to um, different vaccines across the life course. So um, beyond children, two years of age would be one question. And then my second question for you, and you touched upon this a bit in your recommendations, but Given that you have had the opportunity to adapt the tool from India and Timor Less, Malawi to Zimbabwe, if other countries wanted to adapt it, what are some of your key pieces of advice for them as they consider to do this? Over. Thank you, Kate. Thank you very much for the questions. Yes, I think it's possible to actually uh, we use the left course approach, but maybe the issue would be entering all those people onto one tool. I'm not very sure they, because when we were piloting some of the villages with men children, they actually ended up, because each tool takes about, the one that we have is quite long, but it takes about 50 children. So if you are going to be including a life course, in uh, big villages, I think it will be a bit of a challenge, unless if you are going to have very different tools for, for the different age groups, like we have the one for the uh, below two years, we have the one for the up to 11 years, 12 years, and then we have one for the DT, for the pregnant mothers or something like that, then maybe you, you can, people could try and see whether it's possible to implement, to use uh, several tools for the different age groups, but to put on one chart, I don't think it's uh, it's workable. It's not it's not workable. And then the key lessons that I would want to share with the others want to implement. I think when you you start uh, you you train them, it's important to actually emphasize the issue of a, of a, you know it's like these people, the villagers, who were not paying them anything. Well, some of them to start with, they thought. They were going to now to, to get a salary. So we actually explained to them right from the start to say, this is like voluntary. You are just doing it on behalf of your community. 
and uh, who be the one person who will be recognized for your good efforts is you. So you have to make sure the the, the people that you be working in with actually understand their roles very well. I think that's critical. And also to, to follow them up regularly so that at least you remember we are not giving them any incentive or anything, but you have to keep their motivation up so that those visits, I noticed that they actually motivated them a lot. So I think if you are starting this project, make sure you have that facility to be able to continuously support them and follow them up. And the money that will be involved to implement it, but you need to support uh, the, the people that will be implementing the project as much as possible. In the stationery for the for the posters and you know the the, the, the registers for the village outworker, you also need to support them with those ones. Thank you. I hope I've answered your questions, Kate. Wonderful. Thanks so much for that answer, Oscar. Um, we have another question coming in from Joseph. He said that in some countries like in Uganda, we have many religious uh, sects who don't believe in immunization and other health services. Um, does the tool capture those people? Yes, in Zimbabwe, we actually captured them onto the tool, but we would give a reason to say not vaccinated due to religious uh, reasons, but what we told the village health workers and the village heads is to make sure you keep on motivating those people to get their children vaccinated and tell them that you see this is this this house of ours is very weak because your children those children of yours who are not bring to get vaccinated they are they are leaving so many gaps on our on our tool so they, they actually to continuously motivate uh, those vaccine objectors to bring their children for vaccination a few in one clinic, we actually got a report that yes, some of them actually ended up bringing their children for vaccination, uh, but maybe not coming like in, a, in an open, in, it's in, openly, but coming maybe making arrangements with the clinic staff that their children get vaccinated, the child health cards are kept at the clinic, and then the mothers just continuously bring the children, but then the village, village health worker and the village head will remind them of the due dates for their vaccination. So that's the sort of ways to actually circumvent some of these issues that you get uh, with the vaccine objectors. But we were putting them on the tool and making note why their, their books, their bricks were not there. Great, and another question coming in from Laura. Um, Oscar, could you explain um, why Medica Land was chosen in the first place given the larger religious um, related challenges with vaccination in the area? Um, and I think, Oscar, you might be on mute. Yes. Yeah, yeah. The Manika Dindesi has got a lot of uh, uh, vaccine objectors religion, due to religious reasons. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, but also, yes, we, we we actually didn't go to their um, their headquarters, the area around their headquarters where there are a lot of them. We, the, the areas that we chose was their vaccination coverage in that particular area was not as low as the other areas that we chose in Manika Land. We only we chose Makoni, which was which had very low coverage, even though there are few religious objectors. Mutare, where they are the majority of them apostoli they didn't have low coverage in those particular districts. That's why we didn't select that area. Great, and we'll just wait a few more seconds. If anyone else has other questions, again, uh, enter them in the chat box or raise your hand. Uh, we do have a few minutes left and we can take a couple more questions. This is Laura again. While we're waiting, I'd love to, to address Joseph's question a little bit further also around the utility of this tool. So Joseph, um, you know, as Koskar mentioned, 
part of the main utility of My Village, My Home is also to help get the community to understand why the bricks would not be completed. So why are children either not being picked up in the system through birth registration, for example, or not coming back for services because there might be challenges with accessibility, so that's a logistics issue, or challenges with competence in the system, which could have religious overtones, it could have issues with acceptance of the health worker in the community, et cetera. So one of the things that's very important in the dialogue that happens, and particularly having community, local community representatives helping to complete the My Village, My Home tool and be part of that partnership with the health facility and the health worker is exactly to address some of these specific issues of uh, under vaccination, like any religious refusals or other types of cultural aspects that might be there because of different perceptions about the service. So key to it was to put everyone on, a, on, a, on the same playing field in the sense of not particularly targeting a particular religious group or not particularly targeting a particular, a, a, a few individuals who aren't vaccinated, but rather looking at it from that community sense and the importance of sharing the responsibility of vaccination and the health of the community, which in countries like Madagascar, we've also seen being done through the idea of a champion community approach where everyone is looking at the health of the community together for vaccination, nutrition counseling, water sanitation, et cetera. So that's really what's important about this is being able to, to foster that sense of community and equal responsibility for the protection of the children through vaccination and other health services. And then the religious pieces will come up, but then they don't feel like they're being particularly targeted. So that's a good way of, of having the dialogue without being able to um, uh, risk having any particular group feel like they're being targeted. Great, thanks so much for that additional context, Laura. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions come in or hands raised. Um, so if you do have any last minute questions, feel free again to enter them in the chat box. Um, I'm gonna go ahead in the meantime um, and just share a few uh, upcoming Boost offerings that we have available. Um, so one is our Spark series. Um, so this is kind of a bit of a spinoff of the Bright Spots um, series. So Spark's actually surface Boost community members, real-time moments of innovation or overcoming uh, challenges. So really dialing in on one's individual efforts and highlighting unique solutions during um, pivotal moments that result in the improvement of immunization coverage in communities all over the world. Um, so we're looking for the successful rollout of a new tool, engagement of the community, development of strong partnership, um, among other aspects of immunization. Um, so if you are interested in applying for this series, uh, feel free to go to brightspots.boostcommunity.org backslash sparks. Uh, to learn more and submit um, just a short survey form where you can submit your Spark. Um, we also have an upcoming training that will be launched uh, the middle of October. So the Boost Community and uh, the Curve, uh, which is a consortium um, led by the Harvard uh, School of Public Health, um, are excited to, pronounce, uh, uh, to present a four-week training that will teach on the principles of responsive feedback. Uh, which is a process that helps practitioners use data to make better decisions and increase program success uh, while active in the field. Um, so the course, like I said, will start in mid-October. Um, we do have an application form that we ask you to fill out if you're interested in attending the training, um, which we'll share through the chat box. Um, but just a quick note that the application is due next Friday. So if you are interested, please uh, be sure to apply soon. Um, and then a few other quick notes. Um, again, if you're new to the Boost community, we do encourage you to uh, visit boostcommunity.org to set up your profile and to connect uh, with your peers and uh, story submitters today. Uh, we also have a Telegram channel where we uh, share out announcements um, about upcoming uh, events and trainings. Um, we have the Bright Spots Learning Group, which is where we'll be sharing out all the resources from today's session. Um, and then we have uh, just a quick survey to get your feedback on today's session. 
um, we always uh, take this feedback to heart and uh, try to use it to improve future sessions. So be sure to fill out that short survey when you get a chance. Um, and with that, I want to again thank Oscar uh, and the entire JSI Zimbabwe team um, for this excellent presentation today. Um, as I mentioned, if you have additional questions, um, we can address them kind of after the session on the Boost Community platform. And I also noticed that Laura is sending a, great, a bunch of great resources in the chat. Um, we can also share those out in the Bright Spots Learning Group as well. Um, so thanks everyone today uh, for attending the session and we look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you. Thank you from the SI Zimbabwe team. <laughs>